Welcome back, Camden Catholic. Uh, we're going to try and keep this kind of short and sweet and to the point. Um, kind of using today's flip to talk a little bit about things that were going on at the exact same time as the Black Death, right? So an overview of all the Middle Ages that you should know of by now is mainly the fact that, first and foremost, the early Middle Ages are sometimes referred to as, quote-unquote, the Dark Ages, right? A um, lot of disorder, a lot of chaos following the fall of Rome, lots of invading barbarian tribes. Vikings invade, establishment of feudalism. Within feudalism, your king, your lord, your vassal, your serfs, right? What they give back to the empire in this very defunct uh, time period. Clovis consolidates the Franks. Charlemagne consolidates the Holy Roman Empire. Boom! We get the first countries and cities popping up, right? And then we're going to move into the High Middle Ages. And then with the High Middle Ages, we get the establishment of the first kingdoms, right? And one of the big kingdoms was England, established in 1066, Battle of Hastings. Uh, William the Conqueror, William of Normandy slash, writes the Doomsday Book, beats Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings, moves the whole country forward. 1215, Magna Carta, yay! Uh, like, gets signed, King John, launching of the Crusades, etc., 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 right? The main thing is always keeping in mind that the Middle Ages are a transitional phase between the ancient and the modern, right? So, well, let's keep going on our little bit of a timeline. So, we talked about earlier during the High Middle Ages, around 10, 1050 A.D., 1050, uh, 1005, or, like, yeah, early 10, early 1000s, right, the establishment of kingdoms. Now, with the establishment of kingdoms, this mean you're, means you're being led by a king, and underneath him, there are thousands of lords, they all each own a fief, and within that fief, there are vassals, serfs, peasants, and our whole chain of operations works down, right? So, here's the problem. As kings begin to confiscate land following the Crusades, because a lot of lords aren't returning home, right, um, their power is growing very, very large. Now, eventually, this means we're going to get our first, in Europe, resulting country-on-country -country violence. That's not the Crusades, right? So for a long time, remember, we talked about papal supremacy and the Pope reaching out and spreading his influence and things like that. Well, the thing about that is, he kind of kept a lot of countries from fighting with one another. Eventually, countries are going to fight with one another, though. So let's talk about the royal family in France, right? So this is a France royal family uh, family tree. You got Philip III up here, king of France. And then his son, Philip the what? Anybody read that? Anybody? Got something? Maybe? No? It's Philip IV, right? No, you're Roman numerals. And then you're going to come down here, and Louis X is going to be in charge, but he's going to die, and then Philip V is going to die, and then Charles is actually going to be in power, right? So Charles IV was a very, very prominent leader of France. Now, kept him consolidated, did a lot of good had a lot of good ties with the English, a lot of different things like that, but he's also unfortunately going to die. Now, he died with no son and no like heir to the throne. What ended up happening last time we talked about Edward and Alfred the Great over in England, it resulted in a war, right, at the Battle of Hastings. Same thing's going to happen here. When people fight over power, right? Well, here's the thing. This one's a little bit dicier, though. So, Charles, he died as the king of France. His sister, Isabella, has a son named Edward III because she was married to Edward II. Here's the kicker, though. Edward, write this down. Edward is from England, right? Edward, England, bang. He doesn't even live in France. So, a lot of people are a little sketchy about giving the throne of France to a guy that doesn't even live there, right? So, then, though... There's this cat over here, Philip VI, Philip from France, right? Philip VI lives in France, and he is a cousin of Charles, but not by blood, by marriage, right? So he's a cousin of Charles the, um, excuse me, Charles IV, right? So who do you think should take over? Really quick. All right, I'm hearing a lot of Edwards because they're saying related by blood, but I'm hearing a lot of Charles or Philip's because they're saying he's from France and he's actually not living in a different country. So, well, here's the thing. A humongous hundred-year-long war is going to break out because of this. These two guys started the war. Philip VI of France and Edward III of England started this war but did not live to see the end of it, okay? So what's going to end up resulting, though, is the fact that this war began over who's going to rule the kingdom of the country, kingdom of France. But the problem is, is that it then spiraled out of control into less of the fact of who's going to rule France and more along the lines of, can England take France, right? Because a lot of English people believe that they deserve a big chunk of France simply because of guys like William of Normandy, because Normandy is in northern France. So the English 
were consolidated and taken over by a Frenchman. So some Frenchmen say, your allegiance lies with us. And then some English say, well, you belong to us, right? So let's keep going, though. So from 13, it's supposed to say 37. So 13. 37 to 1453, the major players is Philip VI of France and Edward III of England, right? So a massive conflict is going to break out because Philip is actually going to take the throne after the death of his cousin Charles IV, right? Edward felt that he should control France since he owns land in France and he's related to Charles by blood. But here's the thing. Philip is going to tell him to shut his mouth and he's actually going to take away the land in France from Edward and this is going to spiral out of control leading to an international war, right? So, the funny thing about it is, starting in 1337, a grudge built up between the English and the French. That grudge didn't end until 1914 when they allied with one another to actually fight off the Germans, right? Crazy, crazy stuff. Because even all the way up until the 1700s in the United States of America, there was the French and Indian War where the English and the French were still fighting with each other, right? So... Anyway, let's keep going, though, so I can like try and make this as not as long as possible. So next thing, war is going to break out in 1337 and was fought on and off again until 1453. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, my God, 100 years of war. Why wouldn't they just say, hey, you stay over there, you stay over there? There are little intermittent periods of peace. They were not fighting a war constantly for 100 years. That would be insane. But here's the other crazier part. What disease is running around this whole time? The Black Death is running its way through all of Europe, and it is believed that 40% of all the peasants in Europe died in the first year. So, France on the long run, though, is going to end up winning after aligning with Scotland and several others. Now, this is going to lead to a huge problem because the Scottish are going to end up They've hated England for a long time because the English always felt that they had a right to control Scotland because they're on the same island. But this is going to lead to a lot of further problems and further tensions between the Scottish and between the English, right? But France is going to end up winning. Now, there's one certain special person that made it like that actually turned the tides for France. France almost lost. Their country was occupied over 50% of it by the English at one point. And then this person, this person, what do you, who do you think? Anybody? Shout it out. One of the most famous women of all time, right? Joan of Arc. So, let's talk about this lady's stats real quick. She fights for France. Go ahead and write that down. Fights for France, right? Joan of Arc from France. Stats, 19 at her death. Oh, God. So, she was born to a poor peasant family, and she apparently began to hear the voices of gods and saints at the age of 13, right? So, she took a vow of chastity at the age of 13. She said, I will not be held by down by any man or marriage, and I will be my own person, and I will lead this country to victory, right? She took, uh, also, she avoided an arranged marriage by her father at the age of 16. Look at you, girl, right? Like, she actually avoided it, and she ran away, right? So, we'll keep going, though. She cut her hair and actually dressed up like a man. And walked 11 days all the way to Prince Charles's castle, the leader of France at the time. And after a local judge wouldn't listen to her, she then went and pleaded in front of the Prince of France, like, look, you got to listen to me. I've been hearing the voice of God. He told me that I am meant to lead France forward into victory. So apparently what happened, she took Charles and a couple of his bodyguards into a private room. And no one to this day knows what she said or what she did. But Charles came out saying, this woman has heard God, right? And this is her right here. At, actually, this is her victorious at the Battle of Orleans, right? So anyway, he was then granted an army by Charles. He said, if you think you can do this, you go for it, right? You have the Spirit of the Lord behind your back. Joan had a huge victory at the Battle of Orleans and destroyed an entire Anglo-Saxon English army, right? She also, like a stud, wore white armor and wore a white horse into battle. Ha! Right? So, very, very prominent figure. Very good military strateg strategist as well. Charles all the way to Reims following that victory. Now, Reims is one of the holy, or one of the, uh, up. There we go. And in Reims, Charles is going to be crowned king of France. So, here's the irony. The king of France at the time is responsible for ruling because of a woman. Right? So, unfortunately, though, when she tries to take Paris, she's going to end up being captured. Um after winning several battles against the English, right? So she was actually captured in Paris by the English, right? She apparently got shot in the shoulder with an, el or with an arrow and then couldn't get up, and they captured her there. Though, the English put her on trial for different charges, right? So what, what document says, signed in 1215, says that you cannot imprison anyone without just cause? Good job, Miranda, right? The Magna Carta. 
I heard y'all. Good job. So 